Oi! My name is Marin Katusa, and I'm the chief investment strategist at my own firm, Katusa Research, and we run one of the largest funds in the resource sector. What macroeconomic policy will have the greatest impact on the global economy? Well, I think without a doubt, it's a NERP negative interest rate policy that the bankers are using as the new stimulus. I call it an FTD, a financially transmitted disease, and I don't think investors or the media or even the central bankers truly understand the implications that this FTD will have for portfolios stemming from pension funds to retirees to, to even sovereign wealth funds to down to regular portfolio managers. So we're in like, a, a, I call it the Keynes' quantum uh, economics where when they originally modeled this, there, there were no negative interest rates. So everything is kind of in this new uncharted territory. And um, I think it's going to have drastic effects uh, across the board. And, you know, there's this misconception that your mortgage is going to be cheaper or people will be able to get access to cheaper money. Uh, that's not how it's going to work. Um, the velocity of capital is going to really, really slow down. And it's going to be a select few that get access to this cheap or negative interest rate policy money. So it's going to have drastic negative effects such that, you know, almost like in China where you have the, 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 the government rate and then the, the shadow market rate. I see that kind of happening in, in the you know rest of the world now and it's gonna have serious implications. What impact will negative interest rates have on inflation or deflation? Without a doubt, my opinion is it's deflationary. Um, if you look at what the impacts are, and you know, I wrote 40 pages on this in my publication, the, the, the amount of capital chasing the, the fixed number of goods is gonna be less, hence that's deflationary. And you look at the velocity of the capital is also gonna slow down. So it's gonna have a, this double impact. And again, a lot of people think this is a short-term you know, fix, kind of like what QE was. I, I see, I'm taking the other side of that bet. I think it's gonna last a lot longer and, and negative interest rates are gonna go a lot lower. Uh, for example, if you look at how these bonds are trading, so you got the negative interest rate. So first thing you ask yourself is who the hell wants to take a negative interest rate bond, but that's not, these bond managers are looking and going, holy crap, it's trading at like a 30, 40, 50% premium. And that's what they're looking at. So they're willing to cut that in. So they get their bonuses and they get all the numbers that work for them. So it's this self-fulfilling prophecy and rather than returning 35%, maybe they'll return 20 and they'll go a little bit deeper on the negative interest rate. So this is kind of the spread's gonna keep getting bigger and bigger. Uh, that's what I see happening here. How much further negative can interest rates go? 10 years ago, no one would have ever thought that this would even be where we are. So it could go a hell of a lot lower. Could it go negative two and a half? Sure, why not? It all comes down, it's all relative basis. And you know, it goes back to my days, you know, I used to teach calculus. Uh, quantum mechanics essentially was, you can't take the square root of a negative number. Then they said, well, introduce an imaginary variable and but voila, long story short, you get quantum mechanics. That's essentially what we're doing in, you know, this new quantum economics with negative interest rates. So. If we're at you know negative three quarters, why can't we get to negative one and a quarter, negative one and a half? Like, that's what happens in an FTD. This is gonna spread virally. What impact will negative interest rates have on real people? It's gonna be awful. And yet they think it's a good thing. Really, they're injecting themselves with this FTD, thinking that it's gonna help them. They think it's a steroid for themselves when the opposite, it's a, it's a virus for their portfolio. So for example, say you're a 55 year old guy, you're going, wow, you know, I got this mortgage, I can refinance it. My kid's a useless millennial. He's probably gonna move in in the basement with his girlfriend. And you know, they're not really doing anything. They're trying to find themselves in their art career, or whatever the situation may be. And they're going, well, I'll refinance my house. I'm all for negative interest rates, but what they realize is you're not gonna get a negative interest rate mortgage, okay? So that stops there. Secondly, their portfolio, their pension funds are gonna be significantly impacted because the, the, these pension fund managers to base when they started this 30, 40 years ago, when they started in their careers, they expected it, you know, between five and 7% earnings year over year on the thing, but you're not getting that in the bond market. So it, it's turning everything upside down. So their investment returns are gonna shrink significantly, but pro rata, their cost of living and access to capital for the average working person, the average person who needs that capital to you know, sustain their mortgage or CARP, they're not gonna get negative interest rate. They're not gonna get any of the relief. But no one truly understands what's going on here and hence why the, the central bankers are kicking the road, uh, can down the road and the politicians are totally okay with it because everyone lives on this four year cycle and they're not understanding the long-term implications. And this is why I said, you know, in this case, believe it or not, the US dollar actually wins and gold wins. Those are the two places that I think people should have some exposure. And a lot of people go, well, what about Bitcoin? I go, sure, why not? 
you know, have a little bit in it. Uh, I'm not no Bitcoin expert. What I did was I put a, a you know significant amount of money on one of the larger shareholders and who I think is a super smart guy who's really focusing on Bitcoin and, and industries that I'm not paying attention to. So yeah, have, have yourself exposed to areas that should benefit from this FTD that is happening virally. How widespread could negative rate mortgages become? So you got to look at who's getting it, how they qualified. And, you know, you can argue that here in Vancouver, there's so much subsidized housing that, you know, in downtown, some poor bastard spending three and a half million dollars on a two bedroom uh, apartment. And then next door to him is a subsidized housing at, you know, 80% subsidized. So technically that person has a, a negative cost of living versus his peer. So you first have to ask yourself who got that, but more importantly, what the size of that mortgage is. And I just don't see the banks getting to that point because, you know, then we're in a basically socialist state, right? And then at that point, you're going to get taxed on your cash and your portfolio and all sorts of things. And interestingly enough, a lot of people don't know that in Canada, uh, pre-World War II, you used to get dinged uh, tax 3% on your assets that were deemed in your, uh, in your portfolio. So back then, you know, they take your cash and, and your assets, whether you own stock in a railway or whatever in the bank, and they charge you 3%. So that, that you would have to pay that in hard, cold cash. Now they, they changed things with property taxes and they took that tax away. But eventually I do see that also coming back because, you know, the pendulum sure is swinging to, you know, uh, I don't see people getting negative interest rates to for houses because then it's it just, how do you control things? It just, then we truly are in a quantum realm of economics, which doesn't make sense at all. What happens to savings rates with negative interest rate policy? In a negative interest rate policy world, people are recognizing, you know, they'll eventually realize that, oh crap, I'm gonna retire and I'm not getting the returns I expected to have. And I'm, you know, somewhat fis fiscally normal, maybe not conservative, but fiscally, I gotta figure out how to pay ends meet. And it's going to affect the economy because you're not going to do those spontaneous purchases that you regularly did. You're not going to do the vacations or the big dinners. Instead of buying a $200 bottle of wine on your anniversary, you might buy a $50 bottle of wine or a $40 bottle of wine. And that's just the natural evolution of these things. As people start to retire, they start planning and becoming more conservative, and that's going to have its ripple effects across the board. So it's going to force people to save. Then the irony will be, then the government will probably bring in some tax on the savers. So, you know, the Government's gonna screw you whichever way you think, and, and that's just how it is. What about bonds? I actually see that the trend will continue. So as negative interest rates uh, decrease and they'll continue, there's gonna be kind of a, a, a new junk bond era where you know it's not based off of the old valuations we see. For example, the Austrian bond was up over 55% at a negative 0.6 and the bond managers were all over it. So maybe the next savvy banker will say, hey, we'll do uh, point negative seven, and we're happy with yielding 35 or 40% on, on the trading of the bond. So that's kind of the realm I was talking about earlier. I see that continuing longer than people expect because people are gonna have to put their money somewhere. So they're not actually now the bond market, a way to think of it is it's no longer playing the bond for the yield, it's actually paying the bonds for the, the return on the bond, if that makes sense. What is your outlook on the US dollar and gold? Let's talk about how the US dollar plays its role in the resource sector. Uh, so over 90% of all capital infrastructure and debt globally is financed in the US dollar. So pick any commodity you want. Let's take uranium, for example. Um, the world's largest producer of uranium is called Kazatoprom. Uh, the Soviets drilled out this stuff back and you know, between World War II all the way to the fall of the Soviet Union. So Kazakhstan has these incredible uh, uranium fields that produce you know, what's called unconventional, but really the majority of the world's uranium is produced via ISR, used to be called ISL, but now it's called ISR. Um, so I call it the conventional way of doing it now because it's the majority. And how they funded this was really clever by the Kazakhs and the, and the Russians. And if you ever go to uh, Kazakhstan, the language is Russian Cyrillic. You know, the Russians are still there. For people to think that the Russians aren't involved is a fool. Uh, half of the production goes to Russia. So the Russians and Kazakhs are completely aligned. But what they did brilliantly here was they brought the foreigners. So like the company Orano used to be called Ariva, that's the French national company. They brought their money to fund the development of these fields. Cameco, Canada's largest producer of uranium, they brought their funds, and I'll use them specifically as an example. So they used to be the world's largest producer of uranium. They're the third now. So back about 12 years ago, when Cameco struck a deal with Kazataprom, 
on the Inkai project, it was 60% Cameco, 40% Kazatoprom. It's a world-class deposit, nothing against it. Makes money at $12, $13 uranium. But Cameco put up 100% of the money for it. Then as time happened, Cameco started getting their returns, their debt back. The Kazakhs, or let's call them the Soviets, the former Soviets said, hey, Cameco, you know, we're doing all the work. This is our land. Our costs are going up a little bit. So let's renegotiate. So today it's 40% Cameco, 60% Kazatoprom. So I say that this trend is in motion, right? That's part one of this. Part two, the CapEx is built. You have sustaining CapEx or OPEX, we call it in mining, but Generally, the big costs are the front end upfront costs. Now, yes, you got production zones and there's costs going on, but you're producing in a devaluing currency, the Tenge, which is the Kazakh currency, and, and you're bringing in US dollars. So today, the spot price of uranium is about 25 bucks a pound. The Kazakhs are doing better today at $25 uranium than they were at 40 because their Tenge is devalued at that ratio. So we're there. That's what's happening across the board. So the Kazakhs, you know, in the last two decades, went from a million pounds of domestic production when I first went there in like 03 to about 40% uh, and change of the global primary production without really using much of their own money. It was using foreigners. So they're kind of fixed. And you know they're going to take, you know, they're going to be horse trading to get more of that asset. And, and what is a foreigner going to do? You're in the former S FSU at the Kazakhs. You're not going to screw around there. You're going to pretty much, you know, I see chemical ending up with maybe 25 or 30% of the asset. And the Kazakhs are so smart at this. Don't ever underestimate them. And that's just uranium, right? So that's my whole thesis, the cut to kill strategy. Take copper, for example. If you just add Chile and Peru, that's about half of the world's copper right there. Well, what's going on with their currencies? The big mines, the CapExes are in place. Now they're getting in. Yes, you still have OPEX, but they're still making great money at $2.50 copper because their currency is devaluing. So is there a reason why the price of copper has to go ballistic? No. So that's a deflationary effect on these commodities that I've been kind of talking about here. And then all these guys go, hey, well, Marin, you know, come on, we're running out of copper. The problem with most of the people in the resource sector, they use linear mathematics. They think, okay, 3% year over year. That's not how the world works. Fortunately, my, my skill set is in math. And I say, well, here's my model. Here's where I think. And I think this whole shortage of copper by the end of 2021, I don't really buy it. I've been involved in building and actually on the director of one of Canada's largest copper mines. When the tough gets going, the one thing you can say about miners, they're kind of like, uh, uh, they know how to survive. They're very uh, resourceful and they'll start figuring these things out. And you see so many examples that guys are reducing costs, producing more with less, okay? So that, that's a trend that we see going on. Now, if you look at, for example, gold, if you take, we're over $2,000 Canadian ounce of gold. And I, I wrote about this a year and a half ago saying, hey, we're going to have $2,000 gold in Australia and Canada. And your costs are in a devalued currency. Look what's happened to the Australian currency and the Canadian currency. So yet that's a great place to be fundamentally where, you know, and, and another thing I say, if you're a non-US citizen who doesn't have US dollars, gold is a must. But for the American citizen, you're not going to have that big bang on the gold compared to a Canadian or a Russian or a Turk or a Argentinian because of the devaluation factor. Um, the best way to play that would be through the equities, which will get that big, you know, when I remember when Grant videoed me a, a while, a few years ago, look at the, the, what we experienced with new market that became Kirkland Lake. You know, these things went up 60 times and we're not even really in a big gold market yet. Uh, we'll be there. But for the Americans, the best way to play it, and the gold guys who buy and sell gold, they hate when I say this, for an American, the best way to play it is through the equities. What about natural gas? So natural gas, we don't really need to talk about it. There's so much of it. And you look what's going on in Europe, it's kind of a byproduct with the shale. Um, you can't give this stuff away, okay? So like natural gas, uh, be very careful where you, you invest in natural gas. Do you see natural resources equities as better investments? First of all, that would be the only reason to invest in the equities is because you're taking way more risk, so you want much bigger return. You know, the easiest way to play it is just buy gold and sit on it, take no risk. The only risk is somebody steals it from you. Um, so if you're going to play the equity, you got to ask yourself, what's your time frame and, and what's your risk tolerance? Um, I think it's going to be very different than what Rick's experienced through his generation. And Rick's a really good friend of mine. We're partners. You know, we've worked together for years. In the old days, it used to be that today the boomers, 
they would speculate and, and you know, you get these newsletter writers and the market was a lot smaller back then. And these juniors would fly and everyone all, you know, the, the, the rising tide raised all boats. The big difference now is never compared to today in the past has so much money been managed passively. And what I see happening here is part of my article that I wrote was this passive management, you know, they don't have guys like me and Rick sitting around going, well, you know, here's our inflows, what should we buy? These are algos and they're charging things. They're looking at, you know, mi minimum market caps, minimum volumes, minimum, you know, they have this very complicated thing and they're throwing money in the market. They're not gonna go downstream into the junior. So they're gonna play in these bigger caps. And, and, and we're seeing that today where historically it used to be that the juniors used to be so overvalued relative to the majors and mid-tiers. Now we're seeing that the majors are trading much closer and even above NAV. So some of these streamers like Franco, they're trading above NAV, which is you're basing future value into it today. That's because of this passive management just coming in. So in a way you can argue that that money's the dumb money. Like in the past, retail money was seen that way, but yet there's very little retail money today. So you get these juniors that are trading at a huge discount to NAV. And what's gonna happen, I think, differently where the big gains aren't gonna be made from, you know, necessarily discoveries, which they happen, but they're so rare. You know, one in 3,000 ever work and become a mine. Where I think it's gonna be about buyouts. So that's where I've been focusing out on. And, and you've seen so many happen where these larger companies who are trading at a much higher valuation or a premium to NAV buy out something that's trading at 0.7 NAV or 0.8. And that's where you wanna look at. You wanna be able to find quality that's low risk, that's developed trading at low NAV that someone else is gonna buy out. And that's how you get your, you know, what I call the easy doubles and triples. And we've seen them happen like time and again, and, and we've been writing about it. That's where I think this first phase of money's coming in. Then when the market starts seeing many of these happen in another year or so as gold gets going, then you're gonna see people go downstream and then you know all, all, all will go up with the rising tide. So I don't think we're there yet, but I think step one is playing that NAV ARB is where we are right now in the market. So the time frame of this NAV ARB, we're seeing it right now. Um, you know, when you look at uh, when, when I bought just under 10% of new market, which Kirkland Lake merged, that was just an R play, and then you've seen it have you know a 50 bagger return. Uh, same thing happened. You look at what's going on. Atlantic Gold, my friend Stephen Dean, just got bought out by St. Barbara, an Australian company that traded a much higher NAV, came and gobbled them up from cash because it was cheaper for them to raise cash because they're trading at a premium to NAV and buy out a junior. Well, he, I call it a junior because they're producing less than 200,000 ounces a year. Bought out Stephen Dean's Atlantic, and, and it was because he was trading at a discount to NAV, so it's cheaper for the bigger company to issue cash and, and play that. We're seeing that happen in real time, and you're gonna continue to see it happening. Is there a big difference between precious metals markets and others? Historically, uh, gold is always traded at a higher premium on both cash flow and NAV. Uh, for example, 10 years ago, I wrote about how stupid it is that you know these analysts and, and fund managers use 5% NAV when the mine's not even built because the cost of capital is higher than five. But the gold guys get away with that. The copper guys would never get away with that. The base metal guys never get a dis uh, away with it. But for some reason, the gold guys get away with little differences like that. So they get away with 5% discount. Well, good luck trying to find five. The only guy who can find 5% money was Ross Beatty on Equinox. He got it from uh, uh, Mubadala. He got it at five and a half, and that's because it's Ross Beatty, and he's put you know almost $200 million himself into the deal. Other than that, there's no other gold guy that can get 5% money. So using a 5% discount to your MPV is ludicrous, except in gold, which they get away with it. The base metals, uranium, you're looking at 12% discounts. 15% because there's so much risk priced in. So that's the biggest difference. What is the most interesting investment in the natural resources market space? I think you gotta be in gold and just know where you are, know your political risk. And the other one that I love is, you know, I'm probably the most hated guy in uranium because I've been saying, hey, you gotta understand what the Kazakhs are doing. There's a cut to kill strategy here that I've been talking about for a couple of years. Um, the world's largest producer of it has used my data in their PowerPoint. I don't work for them. I got no fees from it, but it's saying that, okay, I've been kind of right on this. I was the keynote at the World Nuclear Fuels Market. I'm one of the largest financiers in the uranium market saying, guys, the spot price is going nowhere for a while. And the best way to play that is through royalties. You want to pick up streams and royalties when nobody wants it. The game for uranium is not over, but you gotta be realistic. And people are using $50 uranium in their evaluations. Well, that's just not realistic. So. 
your cost of capital, the best way to play that, in my opinion, and the way I'm playing it, is through a, a, a royalty and streaming company in that sector. I take no production risk, I no, no permitting risk. You, you just, you're just playing the strict ARB and some of the best returns, Franklin, Nevada, Silver Wheaton, uh, uh, Royal Gold. You look at these guys who've done these great deals and, and that's how you play it. What are the most promising names in the natural resources industry? So the last time you, Real Vision asked me that, I picked Altera, which I was the second largest shareholder. That was with Ross Beattie. That got bought out at a big premium to my for my cost base and my subscribers' cost base because of the whole thesis that I'm playing. Chasing developed assets that pay a yield, that actually reward the investor. So in the gold sector, I'm gonna bet, I bet big with Ross on Equinox Gold. I think that is a no-brainer at current prices. And I think um, if you want another one on gold that no one's talking about, I think Liberty Gold is a no-brainer. I'm one of the larger shareholders, so I'm talking my book, but I don't give a crap. If it wasn't good, I wouldn't buy it. Um, I think they've made a world-class discovery and the guys on that are world-class with Moira and Cal Everett. Moira Smith is, I think, one of the best geos that... Um, here's, a, here, here's an interesting thing. I actually think that our industry is so upside down. If she was a man, she would get the recognition and I think everyone would recognize that, but because she's a woman for whatever reason, I think that's how stupid the resource industry is. I think she's one of the best geologists, period, I've ever met in my life. And um, Liberty's really lucky to have her and I think it's a world-class discovery that nobody's talking about. And then again, I talked about, I think Uranium Royalty Corp is something that I've bet big. Your previous get, Rick Rule, him and I are gonna, I'm the largest investor, the chairman's the second largest, then Rick's the third. I think that's the way to play it. So what you have to have, three-year time frames on both from today. Gold or Bitcoin? It's almost like saying gold versus silver. Uh, why not have a little bit of both? You know, have all of the above. The point of having money is to make money. And uh, I, I, I think that discrediting Bitcoin, I am by no means any Bitcoin expert. I put my money with Mark Hart. I'm a pretty significant shareholder in his fund. He's a good buddy of mine and Worth Ray that run that. And I, I just don't have the time to understand it, but I think he's really smart and he's going to make me a lot of money in it. So why not have US dollars? My, my portfolio, if I was to have my all-star team, go US dollars, gold, some silver, some Bitcoin. Why not?